Tonight on Newsnight, see how the city is preparing to get festive. And the Pittsburgh Penguins may finally be striking a deal on their former igloo. The details next. Plus the latest in campus and tech news. Newsnight begins now. Good evening and welcome to Newsnight. I'm Allison Schubert alongside Josh Krupp. Thanksgiving may be a few weeks away, but the city is already gearing up for Light Up Night. Pittsburgh's Comcast Light Up Night lineup has officially been released, and this year an entire day of family-friendly activities have been planned for Friday, November 17th. According to WTAE, the events were announced on Thursday, almost two weeks before the event will take place. Events include street concerts by Andy Grammer and Maggie Lindemann, ice skating at the PPG rink in PPG Place, multiple tree lighting ceremonies, and a fireworks display to top it all off. The People's Gas Holiday Market will return with vendors in Market Square selling their holiday-themed gifts, and the Santa's House display where kids can get a photo with Santa himself. Food vendors will be at the EQT Plaza and lining Liberty Avenue, Penn Avenue, and Fort Duquesne Boulevard. A new feature this year is Blast, a VIP event selling for $100 in which participants get to go on a rooftop tour of the U.S. Steel Tower and have the chance to watch the fireworks display on the Andy Warhol Bridge. Events will kick off at 11.30 a.m. with the Allegheny County Courthouse Tower and Tree Lighting and will conclude with the fireworks finale. From the ice rink to the old igloo, the Penguins and the city have reached a tentative agreement on the development of the former Civic Arena site. The agreement announced Monday starts a $750 million private investment agreement that will redevelop the site. It includes over 1,000 residential units, 20% of which dedicated to affordable housing. The Penguins agreeing to exchange $15 million in land credits for the land that delayed, ne that delayed negotiations. The team will be required to develop close to 6.5 acres of the 28-acre land by 2020. If it doesn't, the team will be forced to lose parts of the parking revenue it currently receives. Much of the current site is currently devoted to parking. The redevelopment project has been repeatedly stalled by deadline extensions and tensions between the city and team. The Penguins citing multiple issues and the city growing impatient with the lack of progress. Now, the obstacles eliminated. The amendment to the agreement will be presented to the Urban Redevelopment Authority and the Sports and Exhibition Authority board meetings this Thursday. This week was a major week for news on campus with a resignation and a termination. Here with the details and more campus news is Royce Jones. Royce? Point Park's vice president is making headlines in the Globe this week after resigning from his position. Vice President Davion Heron left the United Student Government this past Friday, citing personal reasons for his departure and declined to comment. President Bobby Bertha said in a press release, quote, though we will miss Vice President Heron, we understand and support his decision to step down and are grateful of his many accomplishments over the past four years. President Bertha has not received any nominees yet to fill the position. He has until Friday, November 10th to replace Heron. Point Park's athletic department is making some changes. Head volleyball coach Mike Bruno has been fired. According to the Globe, officials declined to comment, and the specifics are firing, for firing the coach of 13 years, however, they didn't give. In a statement released by the athletic department, they said this. Point Park University volleyball head coach Mike Bruno has been relieved of his duties at the school. He was the head coach of the Pioneers for the last 13 years. As a matter of established policy, Point Park University will not comment further on this personnel matter. In an interview Monday, Bruno said, quote, I want to move forward. I have a lot to, do to offer and it won't be at Point Park anymore. I'm looking forward to the next chapter in my life. Bruno says he will continue to explore the health and fitness world, but will not go back to coaching anytime soon. As far as his time spent at Point Park, the former coach wishes to admire his body of work and friendships he's made in the meantime. Mike Bruno, Bruno had the most wins of any coach in the program and was named Coach of the Year at the 2016 River State Conference. For any Point Park students that, that like the subway on Wood Street, you might want to start looking for a new place to eat. In the near future, 401 Wood Street will no longer house the restaurant. Instead, it will be a part of a brand new Hilton Garden Inn. When asked about the, the new building, owner of the both Wood Street and Market Square locations, Sanat Glomatov, had a simple answer. They sold the building. In an interview, Glomatov said there was no way for the Wood Street location to stay open. The subway location was under contract to stay open until 2024. 
But once the building was, was sold, the contract was terminated. Some may wonder what will happen to the 10% discount offered at the, for Point Park students. You can now redeem your discount at the location in Market Square by presenting your Point Park ID. No specific close dates have been set for the Wood Street location at this time. That's your latest campus news for this week. For more information, thanks, Royce. Sure when we return, why one school in Florida stands tomorrow? Let's head back over to Josh and Allison in the meantime. About the Texas shooting this past Sunday. We'll be right back. Spending just seven minutes climbing stairs each day cuts your risk of a heart attack in half over 10 years. Sure, elevators are convenient, but you burn twice the number of calories just going upstairs than you do while jogging. Think about how long you spend waiting for elevators. The average person spends the equivalent of two years waiting for elevators over the course of their lifetime. Don't let that be you. Save time and increase energy. Next time, take the stairs. I tell these guys all the time to stick to talking sports and not playing sports. Here we go. Ready? Ah. <laughs> Didn't make it. Welcome back. Florida State University announcing a ban on fraternities and sororities Monday. The move following the death of a student after a Phi Delta Theta house party. 20-year-old Andrew Coffey was found unresponsive last Friday morning after the party. He died at the scene after receiving medical treatment. The university president releasing a statement on the school's website with the announcement saying, for the, end, for the suspension to end, there will need to be a new normal for Greek life at the university. He went on to say there must also be a new culture and, quote, our students must be full participants in creating it. The president also announcing a ban on alcohol at student organization events. The Associated Press says alcohol may have been involved, but an official cause of death has not yet been determined. The incident at Florida State is not an unfamiliar story. Last year, Penn State and Louisiana State had fraternity students die due to alcohol-related incidents at parties. Penn State suspended all social functions following its incident, and LSU suspended Greek activities for one month. In an unrelated case Monday, the Washington Post reports an FSU student was arrested and charged with the sale and trafficking of cocaine at the Phi Delta Theta frat house. The incidents occurred at the back end of Parents Weekend at the university. According to CNN, a mass shooting killed 26 people and injured 20 more in a church in Sutherland Springs, Texas on Sunday. The gunman has been identified as 26-year-old Devin Patrick Kelly. Kelly had domestic problems with his mother-in-law, sending threatening texts with her as recently as Sunday morning before the attack on the church she attended. Kelly had a history of domestic problems as he was court-martialed from the Air Force in 2012 for assault on his spouse and their child. The victims ranged in age from 17 months to 77 years old. Among the victims was Kelly's grandmother-in-law, Lula White, who volunteered frequently at the church. According to Freeman Martin of Texas's Department of Public Safety, following the attack, an armed civilian shot Kelly in the side. 
Kelly then called his father, telling him that he didn't think he was going to make it before committing suicide. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has since called this the largest mass shooting in the state's history. Kelly's motivation to carry out the attack is still unknown and the investigation is ongoing. Coming up is one man's power, another man's corruption. What we're learning from arrests in Saudi Arabia. Plus, a typhoon devastated Vietnam Saturday. We'll break it down next. And we'll have Sarah Gibson here to give us the latest in tech news. <laughs> Welcome back. According to BBC News, Typhoon Damri made landfall in southern and central Vietnam on Saturday. Damri is the second typhoon to hit the country in a month, re-damaging farms and fishing boats that were just starting to recover. The area affected most was the city of Nha Trang, which is just over 300 miles south of Da Nang, the same city where world leaders including Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping will be attending an apex summit later this week. Winds of up to 90 miles per hour were recorded and more than 40,000 homes have been damaged. 27 people have been reported dead and 20 more are missing. According to the Vietnam Disaster Management Authority, the missing includes 17 crew members of cargo ships that were sunk off the coast of Binh Dinh, a central province of Vietnam. 30,000 foreign tourists and citizens of the region have been evacuated and widespread power cuts continue to be put into place. Weather experts report that this is the most destructive storm to hit the southern coastal regions in decades. Many roads have become impassable or dangerous, trapping citizens that were unable to evacuate prior to the typhoon. Heavy rains are expected to last until tonight, and a big cleanup operation is now underway. An unprecedented scale of arrests in Saudi Arabia, an attempt to crack down on corruption viewed by some as a way, for the con for, as a way to consolidate power. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salam has been ordering the arrest of dozens of the country's most influential figures. That took place on Sunday, and it included the arrests of 11 of his royal cousins, the kingdom's richest investor, and sitting and former cabinet members, including the biggest rival to the Crown Prince's power. The arrest Sunday coming hours after the Crown Prince was named as the head of a new anti-corruption commission. The crackdown also without formal charges or legal process. President Trump appeared to endorse the arrest, tweeting Tuesday, I have great confidence in King Salman and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. They know exactly what they're doing. Some of those they, some of those they are harshly treating have been milking their country for years. 
The president made Saudi Arabia his first destination during his presidency on his first foreign trip back in May. Now, just because the kingdom is, track, is cracking down on corruption does not necessarily mean it's shifting to a democracy. Time will tell if the moves are truly to curb corruption or a shift to consolidate power. Shifting gears from shifting power, we're joined now by Sarah Gibson, who has the latest in the world of technology. Sarah? Thanks, Allison. The popular ride-hailing service, Uber, is going to be pledging $5 million to organizations that prevent sexual assault over the next five years, according to ABC News. Uber says the money will help the organizations fund their own programs, as well as train around 150 Uber customer service agents to deal with sexual assault reports. This was announced Monday and comes at a time that Uber is trying to clean up their image, with several investigations involving sexual harassment under the company's belt. Raliance, a consortium of groups set to prevent sexual assault, will receive a large portion of the money. The NFL donated roughly $10 million to Raliance last year after a large number of domestic violence scandals involving NFL players. The team members in training will learn how to respond to sexual assault in the workplace from experts and how to, encloach, how to coach employees on asking questions that aren't judgmental. While some critics say that there is no basis of proof that these training programs work, Tracy Breeden, a global safety spokesperson for Uber, says that taking action is better than doing nothing. President Donald Trump's Twitter account was taken down for 11 whole minutes last week by a departing Twitter employee. According to the Washington Post, the account disappeared around 6.45 p.m. last Thursday. Anyone trying to find President Trump's Twitter page were met with a message that said, Sorry, that page doesn't exist. Around 8.05 that night, Twitter came out with a statement saying that the president's account was, quote, Inadvert inadvertently deactivated due to a human error by a Twitter employee, unquote. However, by 10 p.m., the company came out and revealed that it was no accident at all, but it was done intentionally by a Twitter customer support employee on his last day. The president responded the next morning in a tweet saying, quote, My Twitter account was taken down for 11 minutes by a rogue employee. I guess the word must finally be getting out and having an impact, unquote. Investigations are still being done by Twitter. It is still unclear who the employee was, how they accessed the account, and if there were any security breaches that led to the subsequent deactivation. This last Friday, Twitter outlined how it defines harassment, threats, and its policy towards adult content. This comes after Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey promised more transparent and aggressive policies last month after actress Rose McGowan's account was temporarily blocked. While some speculated that it was because she was tweeting about the Harvey Weinstein scandal, it had actually been because she posted someone's phone number, a violation of Twitter policy. Twitter has now explicitly stated that the threat to reveal any personal identifiable information, also known as doxing, is a direct violation of policy and will result in the banning of an account. Also outlined in the terms is the prohibition of wishing death or serious harm upon a person or group of people and the promotion of self-harm or suicide. Twitter also added that they will now be sending an email explaining which policy has been violated when an account is suspended. And that's the latest in tech news. Let's head back over to Allison and Josh at the desk. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. That's your news tonight. For Allison Schubert, I'm Josh Krupp. Good night.